Reynolds, if you could go ahead and start making your way in. We're going to get started in just a moment. For those of you in the overflow room, thanks for uh, making some space in here for those who are visiting. Um, just pray that uh, you all would uh, have hearts that are ready to worship this morning. Excited to be here and, and uh, as we begin the service, sing praises to our God. If you would all stand as you find a place, let's sing Across the Lands together. Yeah. 
us this morning. You can go ahead and be seated. Now we will ready our hearts to commune in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for our sin. So now is a good time to go and grab a cup from one of the tables in the back, if you haven't already. And we invite everyone here who is a believer in Jesus Christ to join us in taking the communion elements. Whether you're a member of this church or not, this time is for all who believe in Christ Jesus and trust him for salvation. However, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have unrepentant sin or you're under church discipline at this church or another church, then I'd ask you to do this. Take this time to look around you. Look around you at what's going on. Pause. Consider the person of Jesus Christ and what the Bible says that he came to do and where you stand before him today. Do you know the Savior who had his body broken and his blood spilt to take the punishment for sinners, though he'd done nothing wrong? Do you know him? At Countryside, we take seriously Scripture's warning to not take these communion elements in an unworthy manner. So please spend some time searching your heart with me this morning, repenting now of the ways that you have missed the mark of God's perfect standard. We take communion together each week, and yet this week we've failed according to God's standard, all of us. We have a merciful God. So let's go before him as the music plays and spend a couple of minutes repenting that we might honor him in taking communion together this morning. Let's go ahead and open up our communion cups. This morning, I would like to set our attention on something utterly unique about the sovereign God of the universe. It's this truth, that the Lord is slow to anger. He is patient in his wrath. He is long-suffering and controlled and decisive. He is all that while still being a just God of wrath. Psalm 103.8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Think about the opening scenes of the Bible. In chapter 1, the timeless God of eternity breathes into existence a pure new world that heralds and reflects his complexity and his beauty and his glory. But that purity is corrupted so quickly. In chapter 3, the creature designed in God's own image, given dominion over creation and relationship with God, has set his face against God, rejecting his rule and choosing self-love over love for his creator. But did God pour out upon the first humans the wrath that they deserved? For profaning his holiness and rejecting his law, did he crush them? No. No, he gave them a promise. In chapter 4, the son of Adam and Eve, the second generation of mankind, Cain, takes the life of his God-fearing brother. Does God crush Cain with the wrath he deserves? No. 
by chapter 6, the world is so eaten up with wickedness, filled with violence and corruption. And God could have ended it all there. He could have executed a final judgment. But even in his flood of Noah's day, he mercifully spared a few of each of his creatures and gave an undeserved promise to the remnant. By chapter 11, man groups together, again in arrogance, looking to reach the heavens with their defiant union. But does God crush them? No. No, he mercifully disperses them. Again and again and again, mankind shows their hatred for God, rebels against him that choose to go their own way. And again and again and again, God holds back his wrath against them. The prophet Nahum said, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. But who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. And the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. So God's a wrathful God. And since the beginning of time, God has had millions and millions of enemies. In fact, not one of the humans that God has created for his glory has been righteous before him. But God's plan to judge the guilty and to execute justice was a plan full of mercy. God's own chosen people despised him and chased idols even as he delivered and protected and fed and clothed them. But Nehemiah said to God, Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Psalm 78 says their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. Why? Why should this God of pure and holy glory put up with a world of little, selfish me monsters that want nothing to do with him? Because God had great love for them. Because God has the same great love for you and me who don't deserve it. Because from before he created mankind, he planned to bear with their rebellion, with our rebellion, to suffer our scorn, and to stay his hand of wrath so that when the right day came, he could dump it on with full force on himself. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Listen, God restrained his wrath toward us to take it upon himself. To crush sin by crushing his own son. 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So when we eat and drink these elements, we should be broken with thanks that this God is not like us. He is not quick-tempered. He's not consumed with immediate wrathful consequences. No, he is a God gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love toward us. He gave his body to be crushed instead of ours. He gave his blood to be spilt instead of ours. What a gracious and merciful God we have. Amen. I'd like to ask one of our deacons, Steve Johnson, to pray for the bread this morning. Uh, bow with me, please. Um, Father, you love us so much that you gave your son, and it's uh, marvelous, but it's, uh, it just has us undone that you love us this much. We don't deserve it, but that's the God that you are. We love you that you gave your body, took all of our sins, past, present, and future, and we can live in peace with you. And we love you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's eat together. I'd like to ask another one of our deacons, Mike Hoskins, to pray for the juice. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, Lord, that while we were sinners, you died for us. Thank you, Lord, that we were once enemies and now we're children. And thank you, Lord, for the fact that there's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all of that. And we pray, Lord, for those here who, who still don't know you. We pray that they would repent and that they would believe in you. We trust you and praise you in your name. Amen. In remembrance, let's drink together. And please stand as we continue worshiping together. Rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and eyes like arrows pierce me, I fix my heart on
Yeah. 
till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand well that's encouraging it's all christ what he has done in us and for us for his glory would you join me as we pray Father, we thank you for Jesus, for your incredible love and grace that's been extended to us in your Son. We thank you that we can be your children, safe and secure in your hands, knowing that our future is settled and our home with you is secure. We're grateful for that. We pray that you would now instruct our hearts, teach us that the Holy Spirit of God, who breathed out the very Word of God, would instruct our hearts so that we might be a people who know you better and follow you more faithfully. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to uh, see some of you ladies who were at our ladies' retreat this past Friday and Saturday. I hope that you survived. How was it? Good? I wasn't able to go. Wrong gender. But I heard nothing but good reports uh, about that. I hope that your heart was encouraged and that you're still chewing on the things that God instructed you with. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the 8th chapter of the book of Daniel again this morning. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 8 for the next two weeks. Most of you are acutely aware that God operates on a timetable that is all his own. He's never too early. He's never too late. He's always right on time. But it's always according to his perfect timing. I think we sometimes struggle with that because we want God to operate on our schedule according to our timetable. And when he doesn't, it can be discouraging. But learning to wait on God and his perfect timing, I think, is good because of what that develops within our hearts. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You see, as we wait for the Lord in his timing, the strength and the courage that we need to handle what he allows into our lives becomes invigorated and renewed. That's why Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 41 or 40 verse 31, They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel is given a second vision where there is another prophecy about events that are in the future. However, while this prophecy dealt with the future from Daniel's vantage point, from where we stand today... This prophecy actually has become history. It's already been fulfilled. Daniel died long before this prophecy was fulfilled. However, we are able to look back in history and see that it was fulfilled precisely how God said it would. In fact, this prophecy, this vision is so precise, it's so accurate that it actually seems as though it were written after the fact. But when God is the author of history, says something is going to happen in our future and happen in a certain way, we can count on it. But it will always be according to his timetable, not ours. Now, if you remember, chapter 7 dealt with four Gentile world kingdoms during what Jesus identified as the times of the Gentiles. This began with Babylon 
and it will end sometime in the future with the second coming of Christ. However, the period that is addressed in Daniel chapter 8 is more narrow in its scope. Daniel's vision here only deals with two kingdoms, Medo-Persia and Greece, and the events that describe in this vision actually occurred in a span of 373 years. Now this chapter can be divided into four sections. Verses 1 through 12 give us the revelation of the vision. Verses 13 through 14 cover an interruption of the vision. Verses 15 through 26 provide the interpretation of the vision. And then verse 27 shows Daniel's reaction to the vision. Now this morning we're going to consider verses uh, 1 through 14. And we're going to consider two things. First we're going to see in verses 1 through 12 the revelation of the vision that God gave to Daniel. This is the revelation of this vision that God gave to him. Now these verses, 1 through 12, give us two things. They give us the context of the vision and they describe the content of the vision. Notice in verses 1 and 2, Daniel, the context of Daniel's vision. Now in the context of these first two verses, Daniel tells us when this vision was given to him. But these verses also reveal when the events of this vision were to unfold. So we see in verse 1 that the historic timing of the vision was relayed by Daniel. This is the historic timing in the context of the vision. Verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. Now, as Daniel starts recounting this vision, he wants to be clear that it was given to him during Belshazzar's reign before the events that were recorded in chapter 5. He said it was in the third year of Belshazzar's reign. If you remember, Belshazzar was the last king to reign in the Babylonian Empire. The first vision that Daniel was actually given, recorded in chapter 7, was in King Belshazzar's first year. So this tells us several things. It lets us know that chronologically, in the book of Daniel, this vision took place after the events of chapter 4 and before the events of chapter 5. It also informs us that this is two years after the first vision that Daniel was given in chapter 7. So the vision was given to Daniel in the year 551 B.C. What this means is that the Babylonian Empire from this point will fall in 12 years and will be replaced by another kingdom. This also lets us know that Daniel would have been 69 years of age when he received this vision. And it lets us know that the Babylonian captivity would continue for Israel for another 13 years. Now, if you remember, in Daniel's first vision in chapter 7, the focus was on the fourth kingdom, which we discovered was Rome. And it dealt with Rome as it relates to Christ's second coming to establish his kingdom. However, in this second vision, the focus is on the second and third kingdoms, which are Medo-Persia and Greece, as they relate not to Christ's second coming, but as they relate to Israel as a people. It would be under the Medo-Persian rule that the Jews would be released from captivity so that they could go back to, re to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. However, under Greek rule, Jerusalem and the temple would be absolutely devastated. So moving from the historic timing of the vision in verse 1, we see the futuristic timing of the vision that was experienced by Daniel. This is, what we see in verse 2 is amazing. Because this vision relates to the future from Daniel's perspective. Because in his vision, he was actually transported to the future. His vision takes him into the future to a palace that wasn't even a, a place yet. Look at verse 2. 
And I saw in the vision. And when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. So here's Daniel. He's transported into the future to the capital of the not yet formed Medo-Persian Empire. Now, Susa is located about 250 miles east of Babylon and about 150 miles north of the Persian Gulf. But during Daniel's day, <laughs> Susa really wasn't much of a city. But in about 100 years from this point, after Daniel's time, the Persian king Xerxes built his palace there, and it actually then became one of the main cities of the Persian Empire. But in Daniel's day, there was no Medo-Persian Empire, and Susa was just a small desert town in the middle of nowhere. This would be like, if you can picture it in your mind, it would be like if George Washington, back in 1778, had a vision and was transported to Washington, D.C., in the year 2020. Washington, D.C. doesn't even resemble what it did when George Washington was alive. Now, while Susa in Daniel's day wasn't much, it would actually become the citadel where the events in the book of Esther would take place, and also where Nehemiah would serve as King Artaxerxes' cupbearer. So Daniel's transported in his vision into the future to Susa beside the Uli Canal, which was basically a 90-foot wide man-made artificial waterway connecting two rivers. So he's very specific as where he was transported in his vision. It was in the heart of what would become Medo-Persian territory. And it was while standing there in his vision that Daniel learned that Medo-Persia, followed by Greece, would be the kingdoms that would be after Babylon. Now what this means is that if you remember back in chapter 5, when King Belshazzar of Babylon saw this handwriting on the wall, and he called for Daniel to interpret it and tell him what it meant, that Daniel already had been given this vision. So he knew that Way back then, in chapter 5, that the kingdom that would overtake Babylon that very night was Medo-Persia. So that's the context of Daniel's vision. In verses 3 through 12, we secondly are given the context, or the content, rather, of Daniel's vision. The content. Now, in these verses, we discover what Daniel saw in this revelation from God. And he saw three things. He saw a vision of a ram, he saw a vision of a goat, and he saw a vision of a horn. So let's work our way through the content of this vision. First, in verses 3 through 4, we see that Daniel saw a vision of a ram. Look at verse 3. He said, I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. Now, we don't have to guess what the ram represented in this vision because verse 20 actually identifies it. Verse 20 says, As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. So, this ram in the vision, we know without a doubt, refers to Medo Persia. If you remember from chapter 2 in Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the statue, Medo-Persia was pictured by the arms and chest of silver. And if you remember from chapter 7 in Daniel's first vision, the vision of the four beasts, Medo-Persia was pictured by the bear that was raised up on one side. And now Daniel sees Medo-Persia in this vision and it's pictured as a ram. A ram is a, a male sheep. Now notice how the ram is described in the vision. Look at the second part in verse 3. Daniel said, It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. So as Daniel sees this ram, he describes three things about it. First he said that the ram had two high 
horns. Now, throughout Scripture, horns speak of power. We've seen that. And from chapter 7, we learn that horns refer to rulers or kingdoms. So the fact that these were high horns indicate that, indicates that this was a really powerful kingdom. There were two horns on the ram because the Medo-Persian empire was actually composed of the two kingdoms of Media and of Persia. But notice that one horn was higher or longer than the other. Why was it longer? Well, this was because after Cyrus merged the Medium king kingdom with the Persian kingdom, the Persian kingdom actually became the more prominent of the two. But notice that the horn, the larger horn, came up not before, but after the other one was in place. And historically, the Persian kingdom emerged as the, as the dominant of the two, even though it came into existence after the Median kingdom kingdom. Now, I know you're just kind of listening to this going, all right, but you ought to be, you ought to be jumping out of your seat for this reason. This is God's word. That incredible detail, in incredible detail, describes before these events ever happened, exactly how they would happen. And if you have trouble believing that the Bible is the inspired word of God, how in the world do you explain this precise accuracy? God was giving Daniel a revelation of the Medo-Persian kingdom before there ever was a Medo-Persian kingdom. And through the image of the ram with the two uneven horns... God described what would uniquely characterize this kingdom before it came into existence. Well, after giving a description of the ram, Daniel second identified what the ram did in the vision. In verse 4, Daniel said that the ram did two things. First, it charged. It charged. Look at verse 4. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. Now, with Persia as the starting point, the charging of the ram shows that the Medo-Persia kingdom would have advanced in three directions. It would come against Babylon toward the west. It would come against Armenia toward the north. And it would come against Egypt and North Africa to the south. And if you read your history books, you find that this is exactly what happened. But notice that the ram not only charged, more importantly, it conquered. The middle of verse 4. No beast could stand before him. And there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. Now an important truth that we saw in the previous chapters in Daniel is that God is responsible for every kingdom and every ruler who is in power. In Daniel 4, 17, it says the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. We see the same thing in chapter 5 in verse 21. The Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. So just as God was responsible for raising up Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, God was also responsible for raising up Cyrus in Medo-Persia. That's the reason no one could rescue from his power. By the way, when it says in verse 4 that he did as he pleased and became great, it indicates that the rulers of Medo-Persia became arrogant because of the things that they accomplished. And just like Belshazzar of Babylon, the kings of Persia refused to recognize God. Instead, they became arrogant, and they assumed that what they accomplished was all because of their wisdom and their might. So in the revelation God gave to Daniel, there was first a vision of a ram. Then as we come to verses 5 through 8, we see that secondly, there was a vision of a goat. A vision of a goat. Daniel says in verse 5, As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth, without touching the ground. 
So here's Daniel. He's looking at the ram in the vision. He's trying to take it all in. He's considering it. He's studying it. He's trying to take it all in. And all of a sudden, he sees a goat coming into the picture. And just like we don't have to guess what the ram represents, we don't have to guess what the goat represents either. Verse 21 identifies this for us. It says, verse 21, and the goat is the king of Greece. So the goat pictures Greece. Now, if you remember from chapter 2, Greece was pictured by the belly and the torso of bronze. And in chapter 7, Greece was pictured by the winged leopard with four heads. But here, Greece is pictured as a goat. Now, we look at that and think, all right, kind of a downgrade. Because goats really don't seem to be that vicious. They don't seem to be that valuable. We eat goats, cabrita. But a goat was a very important symbol for Medo-Persia. And what's remarkable about this is that when Daniel was given this vision, remember Babylon was the leading power in the world. Greece wasn't even a nation yet. It was just a very loose coalition of city-states. So it would have been impossible to predict that Greece would one day be a major power in the world. Well, notice how the goat is described. Verse 5 again, as I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. So Daniel sees Greece as a male goat just flying across the face of the earth, moving from, from the, 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 the west, and this goat's not even touching the ground. This pictures the remarkable speed with which Greece was able to conquer the world. Did you know that it only took 13 years? Now, you all have seen goats. Some of you even raise goats. So you know that goats typically have two horns on the top of their heads between their ears. Those horns are up here between their ears, and they kind of just flow backwards. However, what's remarkable about this goat is that it only had one horn. And that horn wasn't between the goat's ears. That horn was between the goat's eyes. Verse 5 says, And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. So this is a unicorn goat. Now what does the horn on this goat represent? Again, we don't have to guess because verse 21 tells us that the great horn Horn between his eyes is the first king. This is very specific. So the horn's the first king of Greece. Who is that? Well, the first king, when Greece became a world empire, was Alexander II, known more popularly as Alexander the Great. He was the son of Philip of Macedon and was born in the year uh, 356 B.C., his father, Philip, had united Greece with Macedonia and was planning to attack Persia, but he was murdered. And his son, Alexander, who was actually, by the way, educated under Aristotle, you've heard of Aristotle, Alexander was only 20 when he succeeded his father as king. And as soon as he assumed power, you know what he did? He went out and accomplished what his father had planned. Notice in verses 6 through 8 what the goat did. Now, there's five things that the goat did that Daniel describes in these verses. First, notice in verse 6, the goat charged the ram. The goat charged the ram. It says that he came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. So this is Greece under the leadership of Alexander the Great, coming now against the Medo-Persia Empire. This actually happened 217 years after Daniel was given this vision. Now, one of the things that I absolutely love about fulfilled prophecy in Scripture is how history always supports what the Bible declares. Now, one takeaway from this is that you not only have a Bible that can be trusted, you have a, a God a sovereign God who can always be trusted. 
Now, history tells us in the year 334 B.C., when Alexander was only 21 years old, that he launched his first attacks against the Persians. His armies came against them in Asia Minor and defeated them there. His armies, a year and a half later, went against them near the northeastern tip of the Mediterranean Sea and he defeated them there. And then shortly after that, Persia was finally broken near Nineveh in the year 331 B.C. So get this, within only three years, Alexander had conquered Persia and the entire Near Eastern world. And in the next 10 years, he would go on to conquer the world as far south as northern Africa and as far east as western India. This leads to the second thing the goat did. The goat conquered the ram. Now, as the goat conquered the ram, notice in verse 7 what was involved in Greece's conquest over Medo-Persia. First, there was fury. There was fury. It says, I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him. The word enraged means hot. It refers to, to fury. He was worked up. So why was Greece filled with fury as it came against the Medo-Persian Empire? Well, under King Darius III, Medo-Persia had attacked the, the Grecian city-states several times between the years 490 B.C. and 480 B.C. And at that time, the Medo-Persian armies were invincible. However, when young Alexander the Great took power, he went against Persia's six 100,000 soldiers with only 35,000 and defeated them soundly in the year 334 BC. So he conquered Persia with great fury. Secondly, notice there was victory. When the goat with one horn came against the ram, verse 7 says that when it came close, it struck the ram and broke his two horns. And this is exactly what happened when Alexander conquered the Medo-Persian Empire. He completely shattered it. In fact, you know what's fascinating? The first century historian Josephus, who sometimes is accurate, sometimes is not, but he wrote about Alexander the Great coming into Jerusalem. And Josephus said that Alexander's visit was actually capped off with a briefing from the book of Daniel, which, by the way, had been written several centuries earlier. Listen to what Josephus wrote. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person. This was wild. Alexander the Great, who's an unbeliever and never did get saved, he actually read about himself in the Bible, in Daniel chapter 8. And as he read that, or it was read to him, he recognized that he was actually the horn on the goat that broke Medo-Persia. It's remarkable, remarkable. So there's fury, there's victory. Notice third, there's power. The middle of verse 7 says, And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. You remember back in verse 4? There had been a time when Medo-Persia, the ram, was able to do as it wished, and no one could be rescued from its power. However, under Alexander the Great, Greece absolutely crushed the Medo-Persian Empire, and this says there was no one who could rescue it from Greece's power. Why is that? Why is that? Well, it is because the Persian Empire had finished serving its purpose in the plan of God. Now, God had a purpose for Greece, and nothing was going to thwart that purpose. God raises up kings, and God removes kings. So the goat charged the ram and conquered the ram, and then third notice in verse 8 that the goat magnified itself. It says in verse 8, Then the goat became exceedingly great, now, it's certainly true, and history bears out, that Greece, under Alexander the Great, became a great power and was exceedingly great in its might. However, that is not the idea that's being communicated here. When the phrase exceedingly great is used in the Bible to refer to human beings, 
It speaks of arrogance and self-exaltation. Usually that phrase is reserved for God, who is exceedingly great. And while verse 4 says that Medo-Persia had become great, here it says that Greece became exceedingly great. So when Alexander the Great conquered the world, he actually claimed deity for himself, believing that he was a direct descendant of Zeus. But that's what we've seen in the book of Daniel with all the world leaders. Human rulers reject God. They magnify themselves. It was this way for Nebuchadnezzar before he was converted. It was that way for Belshazzar. It was that way for the kings of Medo-Persia. And it was that way for Alexander the Great in Greece. Now there's a fourth thing that we see about the goat and its horn in verse 8. When it was at the height of its power, notice that the goat's horn was broken. Middle of verse 8. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. So when Alexander the Great was at the pinnacle of his power, he died. And that's what's meant here by when he was strong, the great horn was broken. You see, Alexander the Great conquered more of the world than any other ruler that was before him. However, there was a problem. Alexander couldn't conquer himself. When he was in Babylon, he fell ill with a raging fever and he drunk himself to death, get this, at the age of 32. Some say 33. At the age of 32 or 33, the great horn was broken. However, that wasn't the end of the Greek Empire. In the place of the broken horn, in the place of Alexander the Great, four conspicuous horns came up. Now, the sudden and unexpected death of Alexander the Great brought about a lot of conflict throughout the Greek Empire. For about 20 years, his generals, and he had many generals, they fought among themselves However, four of those generals were able to maintain their control. And these four generals became the rulers over the four major regions of the Greek Empire. Lysimachus, he was over Asia Minor. Cassander was over Macedonia and Greece. Ptolemy was over Egypt. And Seleucus was over Syria and Babylon. And by the way, when we get to chapter 11 eventually, we'll see that these last two kingdoms, the Ptolemy and the Seleucid kingdoms, become the focus of another prophecy. It narrows even more. But here, Daniel 8 tells us where they came from. So we've considered two of Daniel's visions. There's a vision of the ram, which we know refers to the Medo-Persian Empire. There's the vision of the goat, which refers to Greece, with Alexander as the single horn between its eyes. But in verses 9 through 12, we see a third vision. There was a vision of the goat's little horn. It says in verse 9, out of one of them came a little horn. Now in chapter 7, we found a little horn, didn't we? And here in chapter 8, we find another little horn. In fact, these two little horns are so much alike, and yet there are some notable differences between them. For instance, the little horn in chapter 7 emerges out of the fourth kingdom, which is Rome, while the little horn in chapter 8 emerges out of the third kingdom, which is Greece. The little horn in chapter 7 arises among ten other horns. The little horn in chapter 8 arises out of one of four horns. And the period of oppression by the little horn in chapter 7 is three and a half years. But the oppression by the little horn in chapter 8, as we'll see later, is 2,300 mornings and evenings. So clearly these are not the same horns. Now when recounting what Daniel saw about this little horn, he does two things. First, he provides the origin of the little horn. Notice verse 9 again says, Out of one of them came a little horn. Out of one of them who? Who's he referring to? Well, out of one of the four rulers of verse 8. Now, history proves that this little horn refers to 
Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He came into power in the Seleucid kingdom of Syria, which is one of the four horns that took over after Alexander died. Ale uh, Antiochus IV was actually the eighth king in the Syrian dynasty, and he ruled from 175 B.C. to 164 B.C. And as we will see, he was a bad dude. He's a bad guy, evil to the core. And he's somewhat of a foreshadow of what the Antichrist, the other little horn, is actually going to be like in the future. Now, after providing the origin of the little horn, Daniel then provides the description of the little horn. And in this description, we see three things in verses 9 through 12. First, we see his deification. His deification. Verse 9 says, referring to this little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Now, the Hebrew term, term, grew exceedingly great, indicates again that he magnified himself. Like the ram and the horn of the great goat, this little horn magnified himself exceedingly. He magnified himself toward every direction, toward the south and to the east and toward the glorious land, which refers to the land of Israel. By the way, Israel was beautiful, not because of its scenery. There's parts of it that are beautiful. It's beautiful because of its spiritual significance. God had chosen Israel to be the center of his story of redemption. Now, after subduing Egypt, history tells us that Antiochus Epiphanes went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem. Well, how far did he exalt himself? Look at verse 10. It says that it grew great, even to the host of heaven. Now the designation here, the host of heaven, does not refer to angels, but rather to the people of God, as we'll see later in this verse. The idea is that Antiochus IV Epiphanes exalted himself as God among God's people. You know that archaeologists have found coins minted from this area when Antiochus ruled? And the inscription on these coins reads this. King Antiochus, God manifest. This guy exalted himself as God in the very land where God's people were. Well, after describing his deification, Daniel describes, secondly, his dominance. Notice his dominance. It says in verse 10 in the middle, And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Well, who's the stars and who's the host? Are they angels? Are they literal stars? Is Daniel seeing in his vision that he actually was able somehow to take these stars from the sky and throw them down and the angels that God created and throw them down? No, the term host in Scripture often applies to God's angelic army. However, here, in this context, it refers to the people of God. And the designation stars is a parallel to the hosts, and it points to back to God's promise that Israel will be like the stars of heaven. So what Daniel saw in his vision was this little horn actually attacking, coming against God's people. Now when Antiochus assaulted Jerusalem, history tells us that he slaughtered over 80,000 Jews in just three days, and he sold 40,000 Jews into slavery. His time in Jerusalem was devastating. There is an anti-God force that is loose in God's creation. And you can identify that force by how it seeks to attack God and his people. Well, notice after describing Antiochus' dominance, third, Daniel describes his defilement. Now, verses 11 and 12 describe the ways that this little horn, Antiochus, brought defilement into the land of Israel. First, he blasphemed God by making himself equal with God. Verse 11 says, It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. Now the phrase, it became great, again emphasizes his self-magnification. And here, he actually magnifies himself against the prince of the host. The prince of the host refers to God. God is the commander of the host. He is the captain of the host. This is God himself. And the little horn is seen making himself here equal with God. 
But notice second, he defamed God by taking away the daily sacrifices to God. The middle of verse 11 says, And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him. What was this? What was the regular burnt offering? This is the daily morning and evening sacrifices that occurred in the temple continually. And Antiochus took them away, making the worship of the one true God illegal. He made a lot of things illegal. He outlawed, outlawed circumcision. He outlawed keeping the Sabbath. He outlawed celebrating Jewish feast days. In fact, when you read in the history books about some of the atrocities of, of Antiochus, it makes your toes curl. When he outlawed circumcision, and some of the faithful Jews continued to circumcise their infants, when Antiochus found out, for instance, one occasion, there were two Jewish women who had their son circumcised, and when he found that out, he had those babies killed, and then had them tied around their mother's necks. And then those mothers were taken to a high precipice and pushed off to their deaths. He was a bad man. When there was a faithful Jewish woman who had six sons who refused to follow Antiochus' uh, ordinances and laws, that Antiochus had these six sons had their tongues cut out, and then they were laid on a platform and fried to death before their mother. And then after they were all dead, he had her killed. So he was a bad man. And he further defied, defiled the temple by placing an image of Zeus in the very holy place and sacrificed a pig on its altar. Now in the Apocrypha of the Catholic Bible, there's two books called First and Second Maccabees. These are not inspired scripture, but they are historical records. And in 1 Maccabees 1, 41 through 50, it says this. Then the king, who is Antiochus, Epiphanes IV, then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and abandon their particular customs. All the Gentiles conformed to the command of the king, and many Israelites delighted in his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. The king sent letters by messenger to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah, ordering them to follow, uh, to follow customs that are foreign to their land, to prohibit burnt offerings, sacrifices, and libations in the sanctuary, to profane the Sabbaths and feast days, to desecrate the sanctuary and the sacred ministers to build pagan altars and temples and shrines, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, to leave their sons uncircumcised, and to defile themselves with every kind of impurity and abomination so that they might forget the law and change all its ordinances. Whoever refused to act according to the command of the king was to be put to death, end quote. In other words, Antiochus defamed God and his people by forbidding them to function as Jews. He was attempting to Hellenize his entire kingdom by causing everyone to follow Greek culture and customs. Well, notice in verse 12 his depravity. It says, And a host will be given over to it, together with the regular burnt offering, because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Now this phrase in the middle of the verse, because of transgressions, refers to the, the vile atrocities of Antiochus, not the transgression of the Jews. While there were definitely Jews who submitted to the demands of this ruler, many of them because they didn't want to be killed, 1 Maccabees 1.63 says that many Jews chose rather to die than be defiled. So what's in focus here is not the sins of God's people, but rather Antioch, Antiochus's brazen defamation against God and God's people and the temple. This was the transgression that he brought upon the temple and the people of God. So in the course of his transgression, what did Daniel see in the vision would happen? Well, first he saw that a host will be given over to the horn. 
In other words, through his depraved acts of terror against God's people, many would be forced to submit to his plan to Hellenize the Jews. Second, Daniel saw in the, that the daily temple sacrifice would be given over to the horn. In other words, he would bring the worship of God at the temple in Jerusalem to a halt. And history tells us that Antiochus had an altar set up in the temple. And he placed an image of Zeus there and turned the priest's chambers in the temple area, the temple precinct, into brothels where people would come and rather than sacrifice to God, they would indulge themselves. Third, Daniel saw that the written word of God would be thrown to the ground. Not literally thrown to the ground, but that it would be trampled upon and destroyed. Antiochus actually burnt every copy of the scriptures that he could find. And if anyone was found with a Torah scroll, they were killed. This was an unbelievable time of suffering for God's people in Israel. And you wonder, how in the world could God allow this mania to commit these horrific atrocities. The question as to why a sovereign God allows evil in the world has troubled believers for centuries. But we have to remember that what men intend for evil, God uses for good. You see, because God is infinitely good and holy, he does not cause evil. However, because he is infinitely good and holy, he's able to bring good out of what others intend for evil. And so Antiochus would prosper in his evil. But it would only be for a time, which leads us to verses 13 and 14. Now after Daniel shared the revelation of the vision God gave to him, we secondly see in these verses the interruption of the, version that God, the vision that God gave to Daniel. This is the interruption. Now in verses 13 and 14, Daniel overhears an angelic conversation in his vision. Remember, he's sort of outside of himself, watching all these things happen, and he, in his vision, is near Susa, or the, the, near the canal there. Now, notice in verse 13 the conversation that Daniel overheard. He says this, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke. Now, who are the holy ones? Well, Daniel hears in his vision, most likely angels communicating. They, like Daniel, were in this vision and were able to see all the horrors that were to occur under the reign of this little horn that would rise in the Greek kingdom. And as Daniel heard them speak, one of the angels asked an important question that really must have been on Daniel's mind. Notice the question that was asked. He says in the middle of verse 13, For how long... Is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? That's the question. Now, angels aren't omniscient. They only know what God reveals to them. So one of the angels wants to know how long this little horn ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, is going to be allowed to prosper. Specifically, he asked, how long would the daily burnt offering not be allowed to happen? How long would the sin taking place in the temple be allowed to take place? How long would the people of God be allowed to be oppressed by this wicked leader? Now, what are angels most concerned about? They're most concerned about the holiness of God, right? For them to see God and his temple and his people subjected to such horrific evil by the sinful man would have been absolutely troubling to this angel. So while one of the angels along with Daniel didn't know how long this would be, another angel who's standing there did. And in verse 14, we see the answer that Daniel received. Now apparently the question that the first angel asked was the exact question that was on Daniel's mind. Because notice that the answer was not directed to the other angel. The answer is directed to him. Verse 14 says, and he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. So after seeing such bad news in this vision, finally Daniel gets some good news. 
the evil campaign of Antioch as Epiphanes against God and his people would be limited. In fact, the angel said it would only be allowed for 2,300 evenings and mornings. This refers to 2,300 days. And the reason that evenings and mornings are identified here is to emphasize the evening and morning sacrifice that were canceled that used to take place daily. So these horrific acts by Antiochus would be limited. He'd only be allowed to persist in this evil for just a little over six years. Now when did this begin? These days began in the year 171 BC when the legitimate high priest in Jerusalem was murdered. That's when everything started. And the days ended with the death of Antiochus Epiphanes in 164 BC. So the prophecy given in this vision to Daniel is a prophecy that has all been fulfilled. Next week, we're going to look at the interpretation of the vision and also Daniel's reaction to it. So what would Daniel chapter 8 have to say to the Jews of Daniel's day? And what can we today in 20? 22 take away well the 70 years of captivity for the jews were nearing an end for daniel and his countrymen in about 13 years they would be encouraged to return to the promised land where they would rebuild the temple and when that happened they might wrongly conclude in their euphoria that the promised kingdom had finally come But Daniel chapter 8 informed them that God's promises concerning his eternal kingdom would be far into the future. And so this prophecy was intended to prepare God's people for persecution. So while there certainly would be cause for rejoicing when they returned to the land and they rebuilt the temple, they needed to understand that there would also be tough times ahead. And this is a perspective, church, that we need today. God has certainly freed us from sin. He has set us free. He saved us. We are his people. We are guaranteed an eternal home with him, right? I mean, all of that God has done by his grace for us. However, until we're home with him in heaven, life is going to be filled with all kinds of difficulties and hardships. Things are not always going to go the way that we would think they should go. So we need to look to God and wait on Him and His timing. We need to remember that while life can certainly be intense, God is always in control. Not only of the future, but He's in control of our lives today. And while we may not understand everything that's going to happen in the days ahead, what we do know is that God is causing all things to work together for his ultimate glory and for our ultimate good. Now, some of you may be going through some very difficult things right now. There's absolutely no way that you can completely understand what the next days, weeks, months, and years have in store for you. But you don't need to know the reasons for what God is doing in your life at the moment. You just need to know That he is your God and that he is in control. The future, just like today, is in his hands. I think another encouraging takeaway from this chapter is the incredible accuracy of the word of God. The God of history is able to reveal in specific detail exactly what is going to happen in the future. And it's prophecies like these, like the fulfilled prophecies of Daniel chapter 8, that give us confidence that the prophecies that haven't yet been fulfilled will be exactly as God has said. Maybe this morning you're not related to Jesus Christ as a child of God. You've never surrendered your life to him. You've never experience the conversion of the soul that God accomplishes in the life of a sinner. Let me just hold this out to you. The good news for you is that God is over the future. 
And if you trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can be spared from the wrath that is to come. Through Jesus Christ, your sins can be forgiven, and you can have a home in heaven forever. You say, but how do I do this? It's not going to be by coming to church. You're not going to impress God by giving an offering to Him. You're not going to impress God by doing a bunch of good things. Nothing you can do is going to bring into your life the reconciliation to God that you need. Only Jesus can do that. And so by turning from your sin and embracing Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Bible declares you can be born again. Will you trust him today? Will you call on the name of the Lord and be saved? Father, thank you for the time that we've had this morning, the time of worship and song, the time of communion, the time of sitting under your teaching. And while some of this is detailed and it just seems to be like boring history for some, what a powerful record of your hand, not only declaring what will be, but seeing what happens, that it's fulfilled exactly as you declared. I pray that you would work in our hearts to give us a heart to wait on you, to trust you when things are difficult, to have confidence that you are over the future as well as our lives today. And for those who don't know you, God, would you encourage them with the hope that's in Christ? Would you draw them to yourselves? And may they experience, even before they leave here today, new life in Christ that's been provided on the cross through the death of your Son. We ask this in Christ's name, for his glory. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we come to the close of our service.
encouraging and that's what we've done father thank you for the time of worship today trust that you've been glorified in our hearts in our midst may you use what we've heard and learned and sung today to encourage our lives this week to look to you to find you faithful in christ's name we pray amen have a great day in the lord